you. Tonight it is my honor to introduce our dinner speaker, Lieutenant Brad Snyder. Lieutenant Snyder is a graduate of the Naval Academy class of 2006. He was a commissioned officer in the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Community, and he has been deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom, respectively. In the fall of 2011, while con conducting combat operations in Afghanistan, Lieutenant Snyder was severely injured when he initiated an improvised landmine. He recovered quickly, however, the blast permanently rendered him blind. Lieutenant Snyder recently competed in the 2012 Paralympics in London. He swam seven events, winning two gold medals and one silver. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Let me start off by saying it's a huge honor for me to come back uh, and be invited to speak in front of you guys tonight. Uh, I was telling some of the other mids, it's, it's a lot of fun for me to come and, and hear your stories about all the amazing things you guys have in your future. I definitely remember you know, being even here at Buddies or downtown talking about uh, service selection and then what it's going to be like to be down in Florida and what deployments were going to be like and a lot of uncertainty but it's very exciting and it's it's equally or more exciting for me to kind of to hear all these stories and be with you guys. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, the way I'd like to do this is uh, I don't like to ramble on. I don't like to talk at you guys. I'd like to talk with you. So I'm going to kind of frame out my story in a couple leadership lessons that I think are relevant. And then I'd like to open it for questions. Daphne's going to help me field those. Uh, if you, you know, at the end, gonna come up to the front, shout them at me. Let me know, you know, where you're from. And, uh, you know what service you're looking to get into and then uh, your question and I'll, I'll uh, announce it and answer so I like fielding questions so uh, anyway uh, Daphne great introduction thank you very much um, so last year I was uh, deployed in uh, in support of Operation Enduring Freedom in the Kandahar province of Afghanistan I was working for a small group of SEALs based out of uh, Camp Simmons and our job was to escort, train and escort the Afghan commandos, which is supposed to be a, a tier above their normal Afghan army guys. Our job was to train them and escort them on operations with the goal being eliminate the influence of the Taliban and uh, show the Afghan country that they had the ability to secure themselves. Uh, we did a whole bunch of different operations across the Kandahar province, specifically in a, in a bad area called Panjway. Uh, after six months of operating there uh, while on patrol, I was attempting to aid two Afghans who stepped on an IED, IED being an improvised explosive device. Uh, we safely evacuated one of them, but while I was running to the second one to help my buddy, I stepped on an IED myself. Uh, it was a pretty, pretty crazy experience. I had gone six months thinking each step was going to be that one, and when it happened, I was pretty shocked and was like, well, I guess this is what it feels like to get blown up, so it was interesting. <laughs> Uh, I was incredibly fortunate with the dynamics of the, the explosion. Uh, there was a separation between the initiation aspect of it and the actual explosion itself. Thus, I really only in incurred injuries on my face. I had some superficial ones across my body, but the, the, the blunt of the damage was done to my face. I actually could still see right after, the, right after the, the blast. I looked down and saw that I had both my legs and both my arms. And right off the bat, I was like, well, this isn't so bad. So that's not. <laughs> Uh, I was able to walk away much to the, uh, you know, it was a, a huge thing to my, my fellow SEALs and EOD guys standing there on the ground watching me walk away. They were all pretty happy about that. And, you know, watching one of your buddies get hurt is a really tough thing. But to know that I was going to be okay went, went a long way for those guys. So I was really fortunate in that regard as well. Um, right off the helicopter, they put me down. Uh, due to the nature of my injuries, I, I was pretty much sedated for a period of 60 hours of which it took those 60 hours to get back to the States. I was in rehab for 
I was in intensive care for three weeks, doing a bunch of surgeries, uh, attempting to repair my eyes. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, but they, they gave me my good looks back, so I'm pretty happy about that, too. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> spent about three weeks in ICU, uh, then was transferred down to a VA hospital in Tampa near my home in St. Petersburg. Got to do five weeks of kind of just physical recovery. Uh, once all my wounds were healed, I started blind rehab. I was in blind rehab for about three months, learning how to shake a stick around and uh, you know figure out what color my shirt is and stuff. That went really well. Um, and as part of that, as part of that rehab, uh, an entity called the U.S. Athletic Blind Association uh, did a lot of legwork on my behalf and, and, and without me knowing and, and, and worked it out such that there was a coach in the Augusta, Georgia area where the blind rehab was uh, whose son was on the Paralympic team who volunteered his time to train veterans in swimming. Uh, and he, it scaled from paraplegics to quadriplegics to guys missing one leg and some of the guys were just learning how to swim and some of them were trying to make the Paralympic team. So this guy was a dream fit for me and uh, so unbeknownst to me the Athletic Blind Association hooked me up with this guy Fred said we can sneak you out of the hospital three days a week if, you're, if you'll agree to swim. And I said of course that sounds awesome. I hate the hospital. It sucks. <laughs> so they'd sneak me out three days a week Monday, Wednesday, Friday. On the way back I'd get Subway instead of the hospital food so I'd be really, really excited about it. <laughs> Um, and then Fred, you know, after swimming with me for a while, he's like, you know, you're not, you're not terrible. I swam here at, at school, and I had done it for a long time, and, and uh, thankfully, blind swimming, there's nothing much in the way of physical detriment. I can still swim just as well as I used to. I just don't steer very well. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, with, with Fred's help, was able to figure that out, uh, figure out how to kind of adapt my stroke so that I could swim in a lane. And, prevent myself from crashing and, and learn how they do it in the Paralympics. And uh, Fred was saying, hey, you know, you, you, out of the blind swimming I've seen, you're, you're good. Yeah, you should give it a try. You should take this seriously. And I said, I don't know. I, you know, I, I've got the Navy's holding on to me, and I've got to figure out my career, and I, I really want to get going. And I had this kind of chip on my shoulder that I was like, I'm not going to let disability slow me down. I'm going to go out and change the world. So I was like, Fred, uh, swimming's great, but I'm going to pass. I've got to go change the world, so, you know, talk to you later. <laughs> He said, no, you really should. And besides, the Athletic Blind Association already paid for it all, so you, you got to go to Colorado and you got to check it out. And I said, all right, well, we'll do this once and we'll just see how it goes. It went really well. So my first swim in Colorado uh, last February, I uh, made the national team standard for the US in one race, a race that I'm traditionally not very good at, the 50. I'm a traditionally a distance guy. And to swim a sprint and make the national team on the sprint side, I was super excited. I, w I ran home and told everyone, I'm a sprinter now. I'm a sprinter now. <laughs> everyone said, no, you're not. <laughs> uh, but uh, that, that swim also landed me at number five in the world. And I was like, wow, that's, that's, I guess that's good, right? And uh, they said, you're not, you're not far off in the number one. But unfortunately, the 50 is a, is a tricky beast. So a second in the 50 is like 15 seconds in a mile. It's really hard to shave that time off. And I kept telling everyone that, everyone, all my friends who aren't, don't necessarily have a swimming background, they're like, you're, you're less than a second from the, the lead. And I was like, well, that's a long second, man. But I decided. Uh, I decided, I was like, all right, I got to take this serious. And it was, a, it was a hard moment, actually, because I had this great opportunity shaping up in Baltimore to work for, as an intern for a startup software company, uh, for a, uh, the CEO of the company I work for now, uh, a West Point grad, like 97, so had a lot of success starting companies in the DC, Baltimore space. Really cool idea that I'll explain offline if you guys want to hear about it. Uh, but I, I got presented this awesome internship through affiliations with SOCOM. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta turn that down. I gotta take this swimming thing serious. So I called up Guy, my now boss, and said, Hey, you know, I'm, I really appreciate this opportunity, uh, but you know, I've got this Paralympic thing, and it's a Paralympic year. I may never have this opportunity again. I'm gonna take swimming seriously. He said, uh, Well, there's no reason you have to turn the internship down. Just come to Baltimore. We'll help you do it. And uh, worked out that uh, the coach at Loyola University, Brian Loeffler had trained Paralympic blind swimmers before and volunteered his time to train me through the summer, which was incredible. Uh, got to train with him all summer, and things, one thing just led to another, and the, the story just shaped up in an incredible way. I was incredibly fortunate to make the, the roster and then uh, was able to kind of execute out in London and, and won two, uh, lost to a Chinaman in the 50, but you know that's because I'm not a sprinter. <laughs> <laughs> But he's a good guy. I respect him a lot. And it was an amazing experience. Uh, so that, that, yeah, that's the, the basic framework of the story. And then I guess what I'd like to do is kind of outline two 
two major lessons from that that you guys can apply to your development as a leader and, and kind of just hopefully lessons you can take with you that will allow you to, I know one of the themes for this week is, is uh, leadership through adversity. And that's a tough gig, you know, adversity is tough on a personal level and, and then having to lead people or have to get back to work or, or go back to doing what you want to do and being <laughs> successful despite austere circumstances can be a very difficult thing. Uh, but something that I've, I've really lent on for the entirety of my career, and this may sound silly, but uh, while, you're, while you're negotiating the stresses of school, you have exams and you, uh, you want to get your service selection right and you, you want to get your GPA just right because your class rank has to be just so or otherwise you won't, you won't get this opportunity. And then there's, there's guys pursuing Rhodes scholarships and there's all this pressure. Pressure, 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 and it, it doesn't ever go away. And then here at, you know, at, the, at the academy, they've got all these liberty restrictions, and you, you can never go out, and you, it's just really tough. And what happens in that environment is a lot of cynicism comes about, and everyone wants to, pardon my French, bitch about this and that, the other thing, and my life is so hard, and this and that, the other thing. Uh, but if you flip that perspective, if you just don't allow yourself to go into that world, if you just put yourself in this mentality that, I'm going to decide to succeed, and I'm going to change the world one step at a time. Those are two very fundamental and cliche mentalities that, you, that can take you anywhere, right? Uh, you're not gonna learn a semester's worth of world history in one night. A lot of people try, <laughs> it doesn't work very well, and I think we've all learned that lesson probably the hard way. Um, you have to learn that stuff iteratively. You have to one step at a time. And that's just how you have to deal with all the stresses in your life. Um, so that's, that's basically the mentality I had when I went blind, right? Like, okay, well, this is a new challenge. I, I'm not going to be able to see anymore. So what does that mean? You know, instead of being like, instead of thinking about all the things I was going to miss, you start thinking about, A, I'm incredibly fortunate that I still have everything that I have. I could be missing limbs. I could be uh, missing a large part of my brain. Or, you know, there's a lot of guys with, who experience blast injuries who never think the same or can't remember things or all those sorts of stuff. I was, I was incredibly fortunate to be able to come, come away with all my faculties. So I felt fortunate that, uh, that I did have all that I had. And then also, I just made a decision that I was going to move forward. I was going to look at, look at things in a positive light and move forward one step at a time, which was actually quite literal when I first started cane walking, because you walk incredibly slow as you're trying to figure out where you're supposed to go. Uh, but I, I think that those two mentalities that I used as a mid, I used in the pool, you know, uh, with, with athletic teams, cynicism is a beast that you gotta, you gotta battle. You know, the, the second everyone starts second guessing coaches' decisions and whining about this and the food sucks and gosh, I have to practice in the morning and oh, I gotta lift during lunch. You know, those, those things are, it's not of any benefit to do that. You just have to decide this is the right thing. I'm going to succeed. I'm going to take every, every day, hour by hour, if I need to. I'm going to take every week, week by week, if I need to. And all of a sudden, May 2013 comes around, and you're throwing your hat in the air, and you've graduated. It's, it's incredible. But you, you get there one foot at a time. So that's one thing that I've really lent on it, and really, I think, led me to success through my transition into blindness. I really, everyone says, and everyone was very quick to tell me, you're going to have dark days. You're going to be really depressed. Uh, it's, it's tough and we're here for you. I really didn't have many dark days. You know, I, there are a couple times I wake up in the morning and I, I'm like, oh man, I'm blind, that sucks. But uh, the overwhelming majority of days I wake up and I'm excited to start that day. It's because I've established that habit, I've established that, that, that mentality that every day is a new opportunity to, su to succeed and I'm gonna take this day one foot at a time. And uh, I, I, that's led me to a lot of success. The second lesson I hope that people will, will, can take from my story is, is, is what I would call compassionate leadership. As you guys are, you're, you have a great opportunity as a mid or as a cadet or uh, someone in college, you're in a, the leadership formation stages, right? You're learning all these lessons, you're reading all these stories, you're hearing all these people talk at you, with you, whatever, and you're, you're, forma you're forming who you will be when you have the opportunity to lead. And some of you have small opportunities to lead, whether it's team captaining or company commander or leader of your church group or reading group or we all watch Oprah together or whatever. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know everyone has opportunities to, to lead and it, it behooves you as a mid to seek those opportunities out and try out stuff, right? You're, you're, you've got this 
card, and it actually goes through probably your ensign time too. Of you can't really mess up. Like you mess something up, they'll be like, oh, it's just an ensign, or oh, it's just a mid. So go out, mess up, fail a bunch, and learn all those lessons and form who you're going to be as a leader. Now, leadership's a tricky beast in that there is there 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 are a lot of books written about leadership, and there are a lot of people who will tell you there's one way to lead, but that's not the case. Everybody's different. Every leadership environment is different. Uh, and who you're going to be a, as a leader is a reflective of your individual personality and who you, how you decide to lead. I decided to lead with what I would call a compassionate leadership style. Uh, I brought on board early on that my main job, my number one job, despite what anyone will tell me, is to take care of my guys, take care of my people. I, you know, in EOD, I was fortunate that I never had more than eight people working for me, but I cared deeply for each of those eight people. And that was my number one job. And that, that idea was reciprocated. My guys knew that, and they trusted me. Uh, and in turn, they took care of me. If there was something I didn't know, they taught me. If there was a, a situation I was getting myself in that would, would negatively reflect on me, they took care of me. Uh, and I think that that compassionate style of leadership goes a long way, and I would, uh, you know, implore for you to kind of look into that as a potential aspect of your leadership style. The biggest evidence that that was of impact uh, was when I was hurt, immediately upon arrival in Bethesda, there were no shortage of 14, 15 people in my hospital room every day. And all those people wanted to do was come and tell me that they cared and they wanted me to get better. Uh, and that was an incredibly motivational, moving and inspiring situation for me. I didn't like being in a situation where I was detrimented. I didn't like being in a situation where I wasn't changing the world, right? I was an EOD guy. I could jump out of planes. I could shoot. I could blow stuff up. I could take apart bombs. You know, I was, in, I was unstoppable. I was invisible. And for that to be taken away from me was a huge blow. But to know that that many people cared about me gave me a lot of strength and gave me a lot of resolve to be like, you know, I have to, I don't have the opportunity to feel sorry for myself. All these people are depending on me. They're all looking at me. Uh, to see how I'm gonna handle this, and I have to handle it with positivity. I have to handle it with a great outlook, and I have to go out and succeed and prove to all these people that I'm not going to let this stop me. And in turn, whatever's afflicting them shouldn't stop them either. And uh, it was a great, it was a kind of a, it was a thing that compounded upon itself. You know, my initial motivations were I need to prove to myself that I can do these sorts of things. And the more that I started doing that, the more people came out of the woodwork and said, hey, this is really inspiring. I appreciate the fact that you're doing what you're doing. I'm like, well, I'm doing what I'm doing just because I want to, but I'm glad that it inspires you, so I guess I'll keep doing it. <laughs> um, so I, over the last year, I, I really recognized how far that, that compassionate style of leadership will take you. And I've also recognized that it doesn't exist everywhere. Uh, I've been working kind of as a civilian for the last six months, despite the fact I'm still active duty. Let's figure out how that works. It's kind of crazy. <coughs> but uh, on the civilian, in the civilian world, it doesn't exist that way. There's a lot of there's a lot of backstabbing, and there's a lot of people who succeed because they talk well about themselves. Uh, but I, I, I can see, with the particular company that I work for, definitely a lot of military guys, a lot of veterans, uh, and we care for each other, and it, it, it makes a huge difference, and it's really instilled in me this kind of desire to, to lead as a compassionate person and lead with the intent of taking care of people, not for a profit, uh, but because I care and because I want the world to be a better place. And I think the sooner that you outline that style of leadership or outline who you're going to be as a leader and you lean on that as you negotiate difficult situations, that is, that is the metric with which you'll, you will succeed. Uh, so I suppose that's all I have to say from now. I, I would really, no question is off limits. If I can't say something because it's classified, I just won't say it. But it, you can ask me about my eyes, you can ask me about Kandahar, you can ask me about uh, swimming, you can ask me about London, whatever you guys want to know. I'm an open book for as long as I'm allowed to stand here. So again, if you would, just come up to the front, shout out your name and where you're from and uh, whatever your question is, and uh, we'll go from there, if that's all right. <laughs> Sorry, I wander when I'm talking. Hi, Thank you guys very much, I appreciate that.
Lieutenant, a microphone. What's that? A microphone. Sure, sure, sure. Lieutenant, I'm a retired police sergeant in Baltimore who retired from gunshot wounds. I'm a college professor. I'm honored to be in your presence. You've inspired not only me, but the delegation I'm with, everybody in this room. And I just want to say God bless you, and you will be, my hand is out, and you will be a leader. You will be a leader and achieve everything. And when I get home to Ocean City, I will tell my children I've met a hero. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the Paralympic Games, what it was like being in London and uh, fitting that? Sure. So I don't have to repeat the question, you guys all heard, right? <laughs> um, back this way. Okay. Paralympic Games was an incredible experience. Uh, I, I, I really didn't know what to expect moving into that. And when I got, when I was part of the team, everyone was pretty, they were timid to call me a rookie, but they called me rookie a lot. Like, and I hated that. I was like, I've paid my dues. I've done a bunch of stuff. I hate being a new guy again. You know, as a mid, you're a new guy. As a plebe, you get, you know, shat on and all kinds of stuff. And then you show up to the first mobile unit, and you're the new guy again. And then you move, and then you're a new guy again. I was like, I don't want to be a new guy again, damn it. But uh, uh, it, it was incredible to be welcomed into that team. And the Paralympics is an incredible incredible group of people because every athlete has an amazing story. People born without limbs and people conquering cerebral palsy and people who are in tragic car accidents who decide that that's not going to be the end for them and they go out and do just, just amazing things. Think of, a, there's quadriplegics who swim. You know how terrifying it would be if you cannot move your arms and legs to dive in a pool? That's just, it's incredible to me. So I remember being very, very inspired by being a part of that roster. Uh, and hearing all those stories, just absolutely incredible people. Uh, but, but still, I guess I had to come to grips with the fact that I was a new guy again. I was a rookie. I didn't know what to expect. And so I had to lean on the veterans on the team and say, what is it going to be like? And uh, I, I tell this story a lot because I think it's funny, but I'm kind of embarrassed about it. I, uh, the, media, the media liked my story before I showed up. So I did a lot of kind of interviews with, with things. And I was in Colorado at the Olympic Training Center for about a week before I left for Germany for another training camp and then went to London. And I was at, on a, what they call a satellite media tour, which is a lot of fun because you sit, in, you sit in two chairs with somebody from the Olympic Committee and you do interview after interview with a whole bunch of news stations across the country. You go right from morning news to morning news to morning news to morning news. And it's kind of neat. They're like, oh, you're now in San Diego. And now you're in Minnesota. And now you're in South Carolina. And you're like, oh, that's awesome. And they ask the same questions, and you get really good at saying the same stuff over and over again. But this one lady asked me a question I wasn't prepared for, and I shot from the hip, and I regret it, but it's still funny. So this lady, <laughs> oops, sorry. The lady asked me, are you nervous to compete in the Paralympics? And in my mind, in a moment of cockiness and arrogance, I was like, no, I'm not nervous. I used to you know, defuse bombs in Afghanistan. How hard can the Paralympics be? And everyone, everyone chuckles at that, and I was like, I shouldn't have said that. That was kind of a dick thing to say. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but in, in terms of stress management, that's kind of the way I felt. I was like, I've, I've been in some really hairy situations, and I've done them, you know, I, aside from when I lost my sight, I did them pretty well, you know? Uh, so I, I, I wasn't nervous until I got there, and the immensity of the moment really grabs you. Uh, there's, there's just a very palpable energy in the air. Everyone's so excited from the... The second you get off the plane in London, there's volunteers there who are escorting you through the airport and you're getting your bags and all of this. And the, the, the volunteers are just super excited to see, oh, they're like, oh, Team USA's here. Let's go like, get autographs and stuff. And then because people are so excited to see you, you get excited. And then it, that's true everywhere you go. And then you get into the village and there's people speaking different languages and all sorts of athletes from everywhere. And, and everyone's just super excited to be there. I've never been anywhere where that large amount of people were that happy to be in one spot. You know, it was absolutely incredible. Uh, and you walk around the village and there's all these statues and uh, memorials and you kind of think of this idea like, you know, I was there two weeks after the Olympics were held. So the Olympic, all the Olympic athletes were walking around the same place I was and it was really a very cool experience. And you walk into the, uh, 
where they serve all the food. I call it a chow hall because I've worked in the army for too long, but uh, the cafeteria, I guess. It's huge. It's four football sized, four football field sized building. It's indoor in like a hangar bay. All around the outside, there's any kind of food you could possibly imagine. Uh, Chinese food, uh, a giant McDonald's, uh, London food, fish and chips, calzones, spaghetti, everything. And so it's tough the first day you walk around, you're like, oh my god, uh, yeah, I'll have an egg roll, and then I'll have this, and I'll have a Big Mac, and uh, whatever. <laughs> and they're like, you're going to eat all that? And I'm like, well, yeah, now I have to. But, uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was, it was really incredible. And then, so that I, I ate my words as far as the nervousness when I went to my first race. The first race is 100 freestyle. And uh, I've never been to, I've competed as a swimmer for many years. And I've competed on varying uh, stages all within the US, never on an international, uh, in an international arena, never in front of more than 1,000 people ever. Like college championships is probably, our conference meet was the most amount of people ever. And I thought that was a big meet, right? And then I walk into that arena and it's huge. I can't see it, but it's absolutely just, you can just tell it's immense by the way it sounds. And then the first day I didn't actually compete, I had the day off, so I sat in the stands and it was just incredible. 18,000 people all going nuts over everything. Like, they're like, oh my God, the athletes are getting into the water to warm up. And everyone's like, oh! <laughs> that guy just dried off with a towel, give him a hand. <laughs> But, uh, it, it, and then I, start, then I started getting nervous. I was like, oh my God, I gotta walk out in front of all those people. And I have to, I have to perform. There's a lot of expectations in front of me. And uh, blind swimming I liken to NASCAR, right? I apologize to any NASCAR fans in the room, but most people watch NASCAR and they're kind of just waiting for something bad to happen, right? And it's kind of a boring NASCAR race when they go around the circle and nothing bad ever happens. They're like, well, that was, that was boring. That's blind swimming. Like, if nothing ever happens, people are like, well, that was all right. They're just waiting for someone to crash, and it happens, and it happens bad. And so the, the, I'm running through my head. I'm like, just don't crash. Like, whatever happens, just don't embarrass yourself. So I warm up, and I get my fancy dance suit on, and I go. You have to show up for your race like 45 minutes in advance because they have to inspect you. There's all these rules. Competing internationally is worse than being a mid at the academy. There's rules after rules after rules. And they're bizarre rules, too. You're like, why is that a rule? Like, there's the, the suit I have on. You know, the, if any of you know anything about swimming, there's all this controversy over suits because they found these, these buoyant ones and all these world records went down. They said, actually, that's kind of cheating, so we're going to go back on the suits. So there's this label that has to go on the suit that says this is an approved label. And there was this weird verbiage on where the label actually had to be. So the way that the rule existed, there was no suit that actually had the label in the right spot. But the, the, there's, you had to... All these suits I had, the label's in the wrong spot, and these people are trying to fiddle around in my pants looking for this label, and it's just, I'm just like, what is it, why? why? It seems stupid to me. But anyway, so you have to show up like 45 minutes in advance, and they, they inspect you, and they go through from top to bottom. They inspect your goggles, they inspect your cap. Uh, Para-athletes cannot have an Olympic rings tattoo because it's some sort of trademark violation. So they, they go over your body head and toe to make sure if you have an Olympic rings tattoo, it's covered up. Thankfully, I don't. Uh, but uh, so you go through this inspection and then you sit in these rows of chairs and as your race approaches and as uh, for future or the heats in front of you go, you advance row by row and there's probably like eight rows of chairs. And the first row of chairs you sit in, it's pretty quiet. It's nice and relaxed. You throw your headphones in, listen to some jams or whatever and you're like, all right, this is good. But each successive row of chairs you get, it gets louder and louder and louder. And all of a sudden you're sitting underneath what feels like I liken it to the Gladiator movie where they're sitting underneath the actual arena and there's lions and stuff running around. And there were no lions at the pa uh, Paralympics, but it felt that way. Just people going nuts about everything. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh God, it's my turn to walk out there. Just walking out in front of that many people was nerve wracking. And then I have to take off all my clothes and swim and hope not to crash. <laughs> this, is, this is gonna be devastating. But uh, what was cool about it is all the nerves go away. You know, after, after training a lot and, you know, I've been swimming for 12 years and I practice day in, day out, uh, the second that I touch the block is the moment where I, I feel at ease. I know I've trained for this moment. I know exactly what I'm doing. I know my race strategy. I know I'm prepared. All of a sudden, I feel really calm. And what's eerie about that moment, that moment when your mind starts to accept the fact that you're going to perform in front of all those people, 
That's the moment where the whistle is blown by the referee and the crowd goes dead silent. 18,000 screaming people are all of a sudden dead quiet. And it's incredible. It's, it's like the silence is deafening. You almost want to fall over when the sound goes away because you know, it was propping you up a second ago and now the room is a vacuum. You can hear a pin drop. And then the referee says, step up onto the block. And then he says, take your mark. And then the buzzer goes. And then all of a sudden, it's incredibly loud again. So up in the air, you know, after the start goes, I can hear the crowd go nuts while I'm flying. And it's cool. <laughs> and you get super excited. And then, uh, you know, and actually, most of the races I don't remember. Like, the adrenaline's so high that all you remember is starting and finishing. And then there was some stuff that happened in between. And apparently, it was good, and it was quick. And, uh, and I was the first guy to touch the wall. So it was really exciting, uh, except for the 50. I lost the 50. But, uh, but yeah, just top to bottom, it was an amazing experience. Uh, uh, after the, I swam the 400 on the, the year anniversary, and there was a lot of pressure put on that moment. I was pretty nervous about it. Uh, there's a lot of expectation, and it's such a wonderful story, right? And everyone, you guys all got to read it on the internet, and you're like, man, that's a cool story. To me, I saw the story happening, but I was like, I don't know if it's going to happen, and I don't know if I'm going to disappoint all these people and all that kind of stuff. So I was pretty nervous before it. Uh, but to, 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 to see it all come to fruition and, and to be there and be there with my coach, be there with my mom especially, it was an incredible experience. Uh, if you, another thing if you take from tonight, go home and hug your mom, because moms, moms worry a lot. And they worry probably more than they should, and they worry more than we want them to, but they worry because they're worried about us, and they care, and they love us. Uh, and so an experience like mine was tough on my mom. To get that phone call at 5 in the morning and say, your son was blown up and kind of looks messed up, uh, was really hard on her. And actually, uh, much to my dismay, the original prognosis of me was much worse than I ended up. So my mom took a big blow that day. Uh, so it was really big for me. To, I gave my medal to my mom and said, thank you. You know, this is yours. This is for you to show you that I'm going to be OK and you don't need to worry about me anymore, which didn't work because she calls me every day and says, how you doing? <laughs> 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 but uh, my, my relationship with my family has been incredibly strengthened through this year. Uh, and uh, I was really thankful to have a conduit like that, have an opportunity like that to give back to my family, my friends, and my support network, who were so incredible to, to, to prop you up. And that's, that's something you, I, I've heard Olympic athletes say too. When you're up on the podium and you hear the national anthem, for those who can, watch the flag get raised, uh, you realize in that moment it's not about you. It's about representing the flag on an international scale. And nothing that you individually did can marry up to the idea that your anthem is being played in front of the rest of the world. And that's a cool moment, a really cool moment. So anyway, that was a long-winded answer, but I hope, <laughs> I hope I got it all in one. <laughs> what else do you guys want to know? Hi, Lieutenant. You want a mic? Yeah, yes. right on. Hi, uh, Keith. I'm a uh, retired Coast Guard chief. Right on. And uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for your okay. service. I wanted to tell, ask if uh, you could describe what team means to you, both maybe in the military and your experience in sports. That's a very interesting question, and I suppose that to answer quickly, I'll put it in the context of my old job, and something I was talking to some of the mids about as well. Uh, team, to me, and especially from a leadership context, is a, a, a grouping of people all with a cohesive goal uh, and end result in mind. And the challenge to that team is to come up with the best possible means to accomplish that goal. And what, that, what is involved in that is identifying the strengths and weaknesses of all members involved. Uh, a team is going to be a collection of all sorts of people. Let's take the Bin Laden raid as an example. Uh, the Bin Laden raid was the result of 10 years of hundreds and thousands of people pouring through every ounce of intel we possibly could, uh, in addition to guys flying drones and CIA guys flipping dudes out in Pakistan in austere environments. And then the end result, SEAL Team 6 gets all the credit, but that was 10 years worth of work of all these different people. That's an incredible team, right? All those people on that team had different strengths and different weaknesses. And the success of finding where he was was in placing people whose strengths were best amplified and their weaknesses were best mitigated. Um, obviously, if SEAL Team 6 did all the intel and, anal and analysis themselves, we would never have found him. We had to lean on organizations like the CIA, National Security Agency, Department of Defense, 
all of those efforts towards a cohesive goal of finding him uh, finally came to fruition. And then it came down to SEAL Team 6 to execute on, on uh, you know, taking him down. Uh, and they did that flawlessly. But uh, I think team means to me finding, everyone, finding everyone's strengths, empowering them to succeed uh, at, a, at a clearly outlined goal. Is that accurate? Does that work for you guys? We have time for one more question. Okay. Good man. Sir, uh, you spoke about on the battlefield, you said you almost felt invisible. Um, can you kind of uh, add on to that? Sure. Let me know if that's something that you learned through, um, you know, some through training or whether it's not just experience. Sure. So I should clarify. On the battlefield, I didn't feel invincible. Uh, it, it, well, okay, I'd say prior to going out, you have a lot of doubt. As with every kind of experience, like exactly like the Paralympics, right? Right before you have to execute, there's all this doubt, and you run through all these scenarios, and the wheels just turn it over and over again. What if this happens? What if the helo goes down? What if my mind detector doesn't work? What if my rifle jams? What if I didn't bring the right stuff? What if it's too hot? What if it's too cold? Uh, all of those things run through your head and all that doubt circulates and causes, causes fear, causes uncertainty, causes butterflies in your stomach. Uh, but the moment that you, the moment every time I stepped off the helicopter, put my feet on the ground, started doing what I was trained to do, uh, an overwhelming sense of confidence comes on and that has everything to do with, uh, you need all your faculties in a moment like that. You don't know what's gonna go on. There are enemies out there who want to kill you. There are bombs in the ground that could destroy you. There's a lot of stresses in that environment and a lot of things you have to keep tabs on. You don't have time for fear and doubt and uncertainty. You have to sequester that and put it away. So you replace that with confidence and that confidence comes from the training that you've done, the tools that you have, and the knowledge that you have. Uh, so you, you just, you put all the fear and the doubt away, you sequester that replace it with confidence, and you move forward one foot at a time. Uh, and that's how deployment worked. And when you look back on missions in retrospect, you're like, ooh, that was hairy, or I shouldn't have done that, or man, I got really close. Uh, there was a couple circumstances where we ran, we did a, a medical evacuation of an injured Afghan. Uh, there were nine people all trouncing around, rendering aid to this guy, uh, preparing for a, a potential ambush and all sorts of stuff. On the way out, we found there was an IED sitting within three feet of all of us for the entire day. We all made it out fine, and we didn't think about that. And at the time, we weren't scared of it, but that thing was there. And it was, that's, when you look back in retrospect, you're like, oh man, that could have been it, you know? So there, when I say I felt invin invincible, I was kind of just trying to capture a, you know, a skill set, uh, the, the things I was capable of doing and, and what it feels like to have that detrimented. Uh, but you know, in, on deployment, there is a lot of, there's a lot of things you have to contend with. And when it comes down to performance time, when it comes down to time to, for the starter buzzer to go off and to dive in the pool and try not to crash, or get off the helo and protect the assault force, that's, that's the time where you have to lean on your training, you have to lean on a positive attitude, you have to lean on confidence, you have to lean on uh, presence of mind. Uh, and, and all those things end up cohesively allowing you to succeed in most cases. Unfortunately, with, with warfare and combat, you know, there's just, there's so many of those things out there that, you know, some, if it's your day, it's your day. You know, I don't lose any sleep over me doing, I, I missed the IED that was underneath me, but you know, I had a lot going on at that moment, and, you know, it's my fault, but I don't let that bother me. So, uh, I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Of course. Wait, 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 it's a little thing. Thank you guys so much. It's, again, it's been my privilege to sit in front of you. I, uh, I look forward to another opportunity to get down here and spend some more time with you guys. So thank you very much. Thank you. appreciate you taking time out of your night to come and speak with us and on behalf of the Naval Academy and the leadership conference right staff you, we sir, would like to give you a token of this as our appreciation. You so Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Right. Thank you. What is it? You're an inspiration. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>